later 90s, there was a growing awareness of the possibilities of um, fatigue being a major issue among seafarers. There were other studies um, looking at uh, seafarers' fatigue, and these are summarised in an excellent review by Ivan Brown. However, what's quite clear from this review is that these are largely anecdotal reports rather than formal pieces of research. Not much was known about fatigue among seafarers. Very well known in highly regulated industries like airlines, uh, for example. We got funding from the Health and Safety Executive for the Maritime uh, and Coast Guard Agency and UMAST, which was the British um, Ships Officers and Trade Union. The focus of our research was going to be on merchant seamen um, and fishermen. Fatigue is difficult to define. And, and there are many definitions of it and they also differ between Europe and the US, for instance. As well as the obvious manifestation, which is falling asleep, you're so tired you actually fall asleep. The other one is more tricky, it's where your ability to analyse and make judgement calls is severely impaired through tiredness. One of the ways we define fatigue is in terms of a fatigue process. This has three main stages. First of all, the factors that put you at risk of feeling tired, working long hours, working at night, high job demands and so on. Then we think of people's perceptions of feeling fatigued and then we think of the outcomes of being fatigued, greater likelihood of falling asleep and in the context of ships, possibly having collisions and so on. We have lots of anecdotal evidence that it is a problem and there are many assumptions that it causes accidents and groundings and there's very little scientific data on it due to the difficulty of collecting. What you find, for example, in road transport is up to 20% of motorway accidents are due to fatigue and therefore it's highly likely that similar things will apply in seafaring. The MAIB, for instance, has actually been cataloguing fatigue-induced accidents for, for really quite some time now. There are dozens of these accidents. They're the people like the airlines who do crash investigations, um, as it were. A couple of years ago, we investigated an accident into a, a coaster called the Antari, which grounded off the Northern Irish coast. Mm -hmm. The ship left Scotland and uh, set a course uh, across the Northern Channel. And the chief officer went on watch, it was the 12 to 6 watch. He uh, sat down in a nice, warm, comfy chair. He'd been working quite hard beforehand and he just fell asleep. So you had an unguided missile going across the North Channel until the next thing the chief officer was aware of was that he was aground. And that's a very good example of what can happen around our coasts. Recently, for example, the Seng Neng One um, in Australia tremendous damage to the uh, Great Barrier Reef. The navigating officer had had two and a half hours sleep in the previous 37 hours. Well, what do you expect? We have at least two or three vessels, I think, each year now that uh, um, are either colliding with each other or, or running aground or hitting rocks because of guys falling asleep at the wheel. Fatigue is probably in the smaller vessels the larger vessels have larger crews and they can work around the problems. It's, it's the other smaller boats that stay out two, three, four days where the problem can arise. We only carried out a very small scale survey, but the results were quite alarming. 16% had been involved in a fatigue related accident and 44% had worked to the point of exhaustion or collapse. You can't uh, relax until the, the work is done and you never know until you pull your nets up how much work there's going to be. We've always had a, a culture, if you like, in, in the whole maritime world of the ship coming first. Seafarers tend to be very can-do people and therefore they try to do their best to keep the ship running, to, to accommodate the owner. We don't have a culture, for instance, as they do in aviation where working times and rest times are strictly regulated. Up until relatively recently it has been totally unregulated and people have done what's necessary. There's no other industry that uh, I can think of where you can operate machinery or drive a bus or anything it would just indefinitely uh, without anybody really caring how tired you are. When you can legally work up to a maximum of 91 or 98 hours per week, you've got a problem. Truck drivers, train drivers, uh, aviation pilots and what have you, 
um, they're not allowed to work more than 40 or 48 hours a week. Why do seafarers, why are they expected to work 70 plus hours a week? Now it is being regulated, but it's the, the problem of trying to adjust to this regulation. You, you have to adjust the culture. It's difficult to be definitive, it's not an exact science, but we use a, a number of indicators. We have our own analysis tools that we do use. We don't have a litmus test that provides a simple indicator of whether fatigue is present or not. One typically uses a variety of different approaches to get a profile which confirms that fatigue is likely or is present. We carry out surveys which ask about risk factors for fatigue, perceptions of fatigue and the outcomes of fatigue. We can then go on board ship and uh, carry out diary studies which provide the same information but on a daily basis. And then we can move to more objective measures. We can see whether their working conditions influence their sleep quality and duration. We can take objective measures of their physiology, hormones such as cortisol are a good indicator of fatigue. And we can take objective measures of performance, so we can show, for example, that when people are fatigued, their reaction times will slow down quite considerably. In the Cardiff study, we used a mixture of onboard testing and surveys to assess fatigue. In a more recent study, Project Horizon, they've used simulators as the basis of their assessment of fatigue in seafarers. They've used some techniques which are similar to the ones we used in Cardiff, but have also introduced other methods which are more suited to a simulator study. Methods that we use are a combination of the subjective and the objective. We have EEG, which is measuring brain activity. As a complement to that, we measure eye movements. In both cases, electrodes are applied to the scalp and around the eyes. We use reaction time tests. We've used diaries where you make your own self-assessment. We've used a test called Karolinska drowsiness test. We call it the black dot test because what you do after the watch, you just ask to sit and, and stare at this black dot for a couple of minutes and it gives you a very good indication of how sleepy you are. We are also using expert judgment of performance of the navigators and the engineers. To say that the old sailing ships with a dozen men on board sailing around Cape Horn weren't fatigued, I think would be an ill statement. But the type of fatigue has changed. There's probably less physical strain than there was in the past. It was much more um, physically involved. You were lifting chains, lifting blocks, topping derricks, this type of thing. There's been a necessity to reduce the numbers of the crew, but I think perhaps we have seen it go far too far. Ships are bigger now, they're more complex. Uh, they're traveling at higher speeds and closer proximity to navigational hazards. There's more of a demand for meeting time schedules. And even the, the complexity, even though automation has often been brought in to allow reduced manning, quite often you'll find that the level of automation and the level of complexity of the systems that people have to deal with can be very fatiguing itself. It's supposed to help us, but it gives us a really boring job. People are not really good at monitoring but that's what we're increasingly pushed to do, is just monitor instead of actively working. One of the problems with making generalisations about seafarers' fatigue is that there's considerable diversity across different sectors. I've worked as a deep sea pilot on oil tankers, and the standards on those ships are much higher. Tankers are at the high end of safety within the marine industry. They're regularly vetted by all the companies who use them. They're regularly port state inspected and that has forced a different culture on them. The part of the industry where fatigue is greatest is in the bulk trades and in the short sea bulk trades. So we're talking about what we call mini bulkers. Quite often they have a very demanding port calls where they're shifting within a port or going to multiple ports in just days. And there is one simple expedient there. Instead of just having a master and a mate where each keep a watch, we need a second mate. Like we find in the much better regulated coastal short sea tanker trade. That can certainly start at the very beginning with ship design to make sure that ships are designed to be as habitable as possible and conducive to good rest. If there's lots of movement and noise and vibrations, that does have a negative impact on your ability to sleep, of course. If you're in port, there's crashing and banging from containers coming in and out of the ship. There's constant interruptions, people knocking on the door. So the quality of sleep you're getting is, is probably going to be rather poor. Nowadays, ships' bridges are designed in nice comfy seats. Even on a well-run ship, if you're on the 12 to 4 at night at 2 o'clock in the morning and you sit in the chair, 
it's very difficult to stay awake. There haven't been sufficient numbers of, of seafarers being trained to go to sea. We've got shortages, and these shortages manifest themselves in a number of ways. You get people promoted, maybe beyond their abilities. You get an issue of less experience in post, in rank. That adds pressure and workloads of others who have to pick up. The officers that were supporting me were less and less experienced, and that made a big, big difference. The phone would go more and more often, and it could often be for very trivial things. I think the reduction of the, the officers has had a knock-on effect on everybody, really, because how do we train the younger officers if we haven't got time to do so because we're so tired on the ship uh, at, at the senior officer level? When discussing the issue of watchkeeping in seafarers, we're primarily talking about navigating officers who work on the bridge. This issue is directly related to the number of crew who are on board. So, for example, if you only have two deck officers, they necessarily have to work 12 hours a day, possibly in a six-on, six-off system. If you have three deck officers, they have to work less hours. I would highlight the, the smaller vessels that are operating around the northwest European coast at the moment, where you only have two watchkeepers. They traditionally work six on, six off. They may be working six on, six off for four, six, maybe eight months. And according to the regulations, that's fine if that's all they do. I work six on, six off for many years. And I know if you do six on, six off, and that's what you actually do, you can work it, you get used to it. What you can't do is work six on, six off system if there's no extra man there to back it up. But unfortunately, these ships t also tend to go into port every day or every other day. And when they're in port, clearly everybody wants to talk to the mate about cargo issues and the master about ship's business. So the, the ability to take their rest becomes interrupted. Just do the simple maths. If a master stands 12 hours watch a day to comply with the STCW uh, requirements, everything outside of watch standing has to be done with only one hour on average a day. All the cargo work, the maintenance work, everything else on the ship has to be done within an average of one hour now. How reasonable is that? I think it's very dubious. The evidence that we do have both from earlier projects and, and other sleepiness studies is that you need to sleep somewhere around six hours and we know that people on a six on six off can't get that, no way. We've got various numbers ranging from three and a half to four and a half and in the absolute best case five hours. One of the projects being carried out at the moment, the Horizon project, is looking at simulations of watchkeeping activities and the extent to which these are influenced by fatigue. What we've done is about one week long, seven day long runs on two different watch systems, the, the four on eight off and the six on six off. Analysis is ongoing. Port time is the killer from the point of view of costs. The ship is cheap to run relatively when it's at sea. So what we want is the ship at sea and we don't want it in port. So all the pressure is to reduce the amount of time a ship's in port. In the past, general cargo ships were in port for two to three weeks. Now with containerization, it's no more than 24 hours. So consequently, people are not getting the opportunity to catch up on their rest periods. You might have six ports to do in eight days, and by the end of that eight days, you would be a completely different person. We do have lots of interviews where people say things like, uh, when we get to sea, I can finally get some rest. The first people up the gangway are not the agent with the mail or anything like that. No, no, it's half a dozen port inspection people. You have various inspectors coming on at different times, all demanding to see key onboard personnel. Again, that can lead to fatigue for the crew because they're not getting their rest. Port state control may be coming on board to uh, check on your fatigue records, but half the ship's company are up to satisfy them and show them these records, and by the time they've left, everyone is twice as tired as when they came on board in the first place. You, for instance, wouldn't dream of going to, a, say, an office in the city demanding an instant interview with the managing director. You would make an appointment. Nobody does that. They expect have instant access to senior officers on board ship. Way to mitigate that, of course, is to either harmonize the inspection so they come at the same time, and or bring shoreside personnel like a superintendent. What we've seen recently with the heightened security arrangements under ISPS, terrorism, piracy, big issue now, particularly off the coast of Somalia and the wider India Ocean, is that ships are going on higher security levels and having to go into lockdown and, and do extra patrols, and this is impacting on their ability to catch up on those intense periods of operations.
In the past, the master was more or less sent away for several months with his ship and traded it as well as he could. Nowadays, he gets 60 emails a day telling him exactly what to do and demanding answers for those emails regardless of the time zones he gets to port. I used to dread going into the email every day. It was going up every voyage, the number of emails, and everyone was a demand to do something. In some ships it's very well managed. What they might do is they put on an extra administrative officer or they might do some of that administration shoreside and use the flexibility of electronic communication. But on some ships a lot of the administration burden is placed on the crew. Uh, ship operators can pick up a telephone, use their mobile phone to talk to the master at an instant. That didn't happen 20, 30 years ago, so therefore the perceived pressure on the master and the ship's team are much greater. The more the boat moves around, the more you've got to move around to stop yourself falling over. It's like doing continuous aerobics, you're going to get tired sooner or later. Obviously, if you do get a chance to get some sleep, if it's rough, chances are you'll get very, very broken sleep. The way people today uh join a ship, they fly halfway around the world and they're expected to go and watch immediately. In our diary study, we asked seafarers about travel to the vessel. Two thirds of seafarers did not have the opportunity to sleep between travelling to the vessel and starting their first shift. Of these seafarers, nearly 50% had travelled for six hours or more and 19% had travelled for 12 hours or more. When you look at people with long working hours, their performance will often be as bad as people who've consumed a lot of alcohol. Many people on shore would be surprised at the hours and the tours of duty that seafarers work. I remember one second officer telling me quite proudly that he'd been without sleep for 28 hours and he was just going on watch at that time. In deep sea fishing days, we used to work 18 on and have six off. But that was only heavy fishing. There were often periods when the fishing wasn't so heavy where we got plenty of extra sleep. What we found in our initial survey were that nearly 50% of the sample were working 85 plus hours a week. Quite often on shore, there's complaints when they get above 35 hours a week. If you look at the way fatigue was dealt with in other forms of transport, other modes of transport, it was, you know, you had frightful motorway accidents with involving lorries, for instance. Right, we must do something about that. So you regulate driver's hours. You don't just regulate driver's hours, but you actually monitor driver's hours by, with proper equipment. There are some very strict requirements for hours of work and rest hour, and those will be tightened up even more when the Marine Labour Convention comes into force. But we know from our confidential reporting that a lot of the crews are not keeping accurate uh, hourly logs. I freely admit that I have filled in my hours of rest records incorrectly. Quite often you don't know until after the event, and then you come down the end of the day or the next day and you start filling in your little boxes, and you realise you've exceeded the STCW requirements. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to freely admit you broke the law on that day and didn't tell anyone? So you just, you just modify the, the figures. In our survey, 40% of seafarers reported at least occasionally under-reporting their working hours. Of more concern is the fact that those seafarers who did admit to under-reporting their working hours were found to be significantly more fatigued and also less healthy according to self-assessment measures. Because the seafarer is normally someone who is a can-to person, he's always trying to be helpful, we quite often have situations where the hours of work records are filled in for the next month, for example. Mariners probably aren't doing themselves a lot of favours because uh, the ship-owning community can stand up quite accurately and say that they have years and years of rest hour logs that show that there is no overworking. The seafarer doesn't realise that actually recording of hours work is to a to degree a protection to him. It's his safety net in allowing him to record actually the excessive hours he may be asked to work. There's a, a Swedish project a couple of years ago by uh... Fredrik Hjort at Kalmar Maritime University and he's recorded snippets of interviews where people tell their experiences of trying to actually record the proper working hours and the master stopping them saying I can't, I can't send this in. Quite often in many cases when, when we raise this issue with the owner they throw their hands up in horror because they don't realise that the seafarer is actually flogging the log. It's not what the intention is. It's not all companies, but in some companies, I think uh, the seafarers themselves feel themselves under pressure not to upset their owners because they might lose a job. I mean, you know, that, that's a, a real fear. And this points to the pressure that's put on seafarers to, to make sure that they don't fall foul of the regulations, to make sure that 
the records at least show that everything is, is okay. The whole of the maritime industry can always be divided into three parts. There's the one part which is, uh, we'll always do what's right. They will follow the regulations to the letter. There are some ships that have brilliant systems for recording hours of work and the owners scrutinise those and in those cases you tend to find they're the ones where you don't have accidents that relate to fatigue. There are those who probably won't do unless they're forced to by regulators coming on board and bullying them to do it. And the third part, which never do anything unless they're actually prosecuted. It is, however, very difficult for a port state control inspector to come down if the logbooks are not accurate. One surveyor was tasked specifically for doing this for the MCA a couple of years ago. He spent seven hours on a ship checking over one set of hours of work papers. And during that period, he's supposed to inspect the entire ship, of course. They compare the record of hours of uh, work or hours of rest against maybe the deck log or the engine room log, and they find that seafarers who are supposedly fast asleep are actually hauling up the anchor or preparing to turn the engines over. Once you have to start casting your net that wide, you've got to say, is it worth it? And can I afford the resources to do it? Then you might say, of course, can I afford the resources not to do it? At the moment, you have a minimum manning certificate based upon what's the least number of people you need to get this ship from A to B. In many cases, it should be much more obvious that a ship on a certain trade with a certain manning level really is going to be pushing that limit. The real study we need to actually look at is what's actually going on on a ship. Each ship is unique in its operation and we should actually look at that ship, see what the operation is and make sure that it is safely manned. Cost is another big element that intrudes into all of this. You don't get changes without putting the costs up. Responsible companies find themselves having to cut corners simply to stay in business and I think that's, that's a, a big part of the problem. The ship owners will say, and correctly, we have to have a level playing field. You'd have to do it absolutely internationally. Otherwise, you would have one country's ships having enjoying a competitive advantage over another. Two mates and a master um, should be considered normal for a ship of more than 3,000 tonnes. Even that, as we thought, fairly low-level request was rejected um, both by Europe and by, by the IMO. We have to come down to the fact that actually there is a shortage of seafarers anyway. How are we going to get the extra seafarers if we need them to fill in the roles that may be needed to prevent fatigue? Due to economic pressure on the fishermen themselves, they, they can't afford to take on crew. And you'll find that these days there's a lot more guys taking their boats single-handedly. A two-man vessel the skipper might decide just to go single-handed on and the vessel with three or four men might just take one man off for economic reasons so there's less men doing more work. I used to work for a particular flag administration and you would get the situation where for example a ship that had been on the Dutch flag uh, the owners would come to you and say look we want to change to your flag the Dutch only operate with seven, we want to operate with six. If we operate with six, you know, we'll, we'll put our ship on your flag. And that was a very powerful bargaining chip. Come to my flag and I'll enable you to operate with only 10 men on a very large crude carrier, whereas they will require you to have 15. Without a shadow of doubt, there has been a certain amount of competition among flags to enable ships to be run with the smallest possible crews. You either have to have a new international requirement that states this is how you man your ship, or you make a unilateral decision that the, the UK will insist that this is how all its ships are manned. When the UK was thinking of going unilateral on this, they were told very firmly that you can't go in unilateral on this, A, because the EU wouldn't allow it, but B, because it would immediately cause an exodus of people from the Red Ensign. If you're asking for one or two more men than everybody else in the world, why come to us? People are resistant about speaking out about fatigue because, quite frankly, they're afraid of losing their jobs. Any master that's brave enough to go and anchor his ship because his crew is fatigued will very soon find himself on the next flight home. I can't remember a case where a master has said, I'm not sailing until we've all had a sleep. I know one incident only in my 
career when another master refused to sail. We all knew about it all around the fleet and he had to explain himself very, very carefully as to why he'd done that. If you examine the causation of, an, of almost any marine accident, there are a whole range of different factors which actually combined, they may appear to be singularly unimportant, but together they actually cause the accident. Several barriers have to fail normally for there to be to be an accident. And I think fatigue is, 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 is the same. We talk about different shift patterns, the levels of manning, the nature of the work, port turnarounds. What we found is that one must look at the combined effects of different factors. So the person who's most susceptible to fatigue is the person who's exposed to all of the types of risk factors that I've just described. The reason why he's asleep and hitting the rocks is because of several other factors. It's always a combination of things, and it's that combination that people need to look at. If regulation can be effective in lots of other areas, and it is, then it could be effective in this one too. While it's very easy to say this is something for the individual seafarer or this is something for the individual ship, it clearly has to be something which involves the industry as a whole. The most obvious solution, particularly to the ships I mentioned earlier, the small coasters, is to increase the number of watchkeepers on board. And it's something that the MAIB have recommended in the past, that there should be a minimum of three watchkeepers on board any ship. Secondly, a cultural change where people are prepared to realise, just as they are in aviation, that it's dangerous to go over your working hours. Unfortunately, many companies these days employ seafarers on a short-term basis. They work for six months and they go on to another contract to another shipping company. And there's no way on this earth that this that officer or seafarer is going to buy into that safety culture because in, in a couple of months' time, he'll be on somebody else's ship who wants them to do something completely different. That stability and that buy-in is something which is necessary if it's going to work effectively. It's crucial that working hours are recorded properly and as well as this formal regulation, we must also improve uh, training and guidance so that we can prevent and manage fatigue. We need rules that set maximum hours of work at a level that uh, will allow people to have rest and proper recuperation. One must also look not just at what happens generally, but those specific rare occurrences when fatigue is likely to be a particular problem, just in the same way that we have regular lifeboat drills. It doesn't imply that everyone's going into the boats on a regular basis, but we should really know how to deal with these occasional fatigue-related risks to these safety-critical operations. The reason why fatigue is not being dealt with properly is because it's not seen to be important by enough people. Fatigue is a very real problem. It does cause deaths, it does cause accidents. It is a complicated issue, not least because any solution will incur additional costs to the industry at a time when the industry is hard pressed to make a profit. The industry itself is suffering from the effects of fatigue when you get pollution, when you get uh, loss of life and what have you. If it's caused by fatigue, then that is is not helping our industry at all. Although our project on seafarers uh, fatigue was uh, very substantial, there's clearly a need for further research in the area. This is not necessarily fundamental research on fatigue, but it's what I call action research, namely providing the evidence base mm. rather than relying on anecdotal uh, comments and observations. The role of research is really quite important because it's actually producing the armour and the ammunition to go to the IMO and to the regulators and say, well, these things are happening, these are the facts, and because of these facts, we believe that there is a strong case for larger crews, shorter working hours, stronger regulation, but they won't happen without the actual hard and fast evidence that research can produce. <laughs>